Daniel chapter 2. Last week we started this new series in the book of Daniel. And to recap, last week we were introduced to three Hebrew men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were taken captive and brought over 500 miles to this new area. And in the midst of this new culture, this pagan culture, they had purposed in their heart, I'm going to live for God in the midst of this culture that is not living for God. And they took a stand with the food that they were being served, and they did this 10-day test And it was successful, and um, they continued in that diet. And then it closed, Daniel 1, recognizing God's favor on these men. It was Daniel 1, 17 through 21. But specifically in verses 17 and 20, it says that God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom, and God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. And in Daniel 2, you're going to see this start to play out from the wisdom, but also the special ability to interpret dreams. In verse 20, whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than anybody else in his kingdom. Hey, that's kind of where we left off last week as we get ready to go here into Daniel 2. By show of hands, how many of you have ever dreamed a dream before? Hey, and just, uh, I guess you'd say a public service announcement, there will be no daydreaming during this message. You know, dreams are common, and they're actually a part of the REM sleep process that we all go through, that sleep cycle. And they actually, dreams will build in length as you sleep through the night. And that's why you might remember some of those dreams that were closer to the point where you woke up. And um, dreams can be influenced by a lot of things. One of them can be what kind of food you had the night before. Hey, I know sometimes they attach that seasoning oregano with some pretty crazy dreams, right? And dreams can also be attached to the amount of stress that's in your life. And maybe things that are on your heart and you're thinking about them a lot. Or, or maybe they're attached to a traumatic event and, and these dreams come forward. And so there's a variety of ways in which our body and our mind processes all of this stuff. And in the midst of all these things that are natural, right? this is how we operate as our bodies uh, get that REM sleep. God can also use that process. And he can speak through dreams, speaking through them even today. Now, it's important to be careful that every single dream we have, we don't go, God just told me something, okay? It's to make sure if if you feel like there was some weight to that dream that was spiritual in nature is it would be good to maybe talk about that with some trusted Christian uh, leadership or friends that can help you to process that and say, is this really from the Lord and how does that check out with the word of God? But God can use dreams. He says that in his word and today's message is entitled Gospel Dreamer. And God actually uses this Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, who's a pagan king and he uses him and he dreams a gospel dream. And you'll see why it's a gospel dream here in a moment. You're going to find out his dream is, is actually just kind of interesting and a little bit loaded. And he needs some help interpreting what on earth this dream means. And so before we get into Daniel 2, I want to take a moment and pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon this time in the Word. So would you pray with me before we begin? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to us at this time. We thank you for this account of Daniel 2, the dream that you gave Nebuchadnezzar and the interpretation that you gave to Daniel and how there's implications of that dream and interpretation even here and now. And Father, I'm asking for your grace in communicating what it is you've put on my heart to share And so we invite your spirit to just have his way with this time. We pray for a blessing on our children's ministry and team. Bless them 
as they learn about Jesus. Lord, we ask for your grace now. It's your name we pray. Amen. All right, Daniel 2, we're going to cover this whole chapter, so buckle up. All right, Daniel 2, starting in verse 1. One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. And as they stood before the king, he said, I have had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, Long live the king! Tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. But the king said to the astrologers, I am serious about this. If you don't tell me what my dream was and what it means, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. But if you tell me what I dreamed and what the dream means, I will give you many wonderful gifts and honors. Just tell me the dream and what it means. And then they said, Please, your majesty, Tell us the dream, and we will tell you what it means. The king replied, I know what you're doing. You're stalling for time because you know I'm serious when I say if you don't tell me the dream, you're doomed. So you you conspired now to tell me lies, hoping that I'll change my mind. But tell me the dream, and then I'll know that you can tell me what it means. The astrologers replied to the king, No one on earth can tell the king his dream, and no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. The king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among the people. The king was furious when he heard this, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Arioch, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Arioch told him all that had happened. And Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that'd be the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he told them what had happened. And he urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven, and he said, Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events, and he removes kings and sets up other kings, and he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars, and he reveals deep and mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in darkness, though he is surrounded by light. I thank you and praise you, God of my ancestors, for you have given me wisdom and strength. You have told me what we asked of you and revealed to us what the king demanded. Now verse 24, Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had ordered to execute the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel said, don't kill the wise men. Take me to the king and I will tell him the meaning of his dream. Arioch quickly took Daniel to the king and said, I have found one of the captives from Judah who will tell the king the meaning of his dream. The king said to Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, he says, is this true? Can you tell me what my dream was and what it means? And Daniel replied, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. Now I will tell you your dream and the visions you saw as you lay on your bed. And while your majesty was sleeping, you dreamed about coming events. He who reveals secrets has shown you what is going to happen. And it is not because I am wiser than anyone else that I know the secret of your dream. But it's because God wants you to understand what is in your heart. In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. 
The head of the statue was made of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver, and its belly and thighs were bronze, and its legs were iron, and its feet were a combination of iron and baked clay. And as you watched, a rock was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. And it struck the feet of iron and clay, smashing them to bits. And the whole statue was crushed into small pieces of iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold. Then the wind blew them away without a trace, like chaff on a threshing floor. But the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. That was the dream. Now we will tell the king what it means. Your majesty, you are the greatest of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and honor. He has made you the ruler over all the inhabited world and has put even the wild animals and birds under your control. You are the head of gold. But after your kingdom comes to an end, Another kingdom inferior to yours will rise to take your place. And after that kingdom has fallen, yet a third kingdom, represented by bronze, will rise to rule the world. Following that kingdom, there will be a fourth one as strong as iron. That kingdom will smash and crush all previous empires, just as iron smashes and crushes everything it strikes." The feet and toes you saw were a combination of iron and baked clay, showing that this kingdom will be divided. Like iron mixed with clay, it will have some of the strength of iron. But while some parts of it will be as strong as iron, other parts will be as weak as clay. And this mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming alliances with each other through intermarriage. But they will not hold together, just as iron and clay do not mix. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hands. That crushed to pieces the statue of iron bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its meaning is certain. And it closes here with Nebuchadnezzar's response. He throws himself down before Daniel and worshipped him, which I'm sure Daniel was very uncomfortable with. And he commanded his people to offer sacrifices and burn sweet incense before Daniel And the king said to Daniel, Truly, your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as chief over all his wise men. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be in charge of all the affairs of the province of Babylon, while Daniel remained in the king's court. All right. Loaded chapter there. And the dream, you can get lost in the dream here, but I think it's important to understand the interpretation of this dream and the implications uh, that it has for today. And we'll get to that in a moment, but I want to walk through this kind of section by section, starting with the first three verses, that these indeed are divine dreams. And we notice here that there's some sort of stress that Nebuchadnezzar is under. You know, the the, the word says he had such disturbing dreams that he, he couldn't sleep. It was giving him insomnia. And then when he tells people about it, he says, I've had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. And here's the thing. The responsibility of being king over a kingdom, when you're going out and you're conquering other kingdoms, the kingdom grows, but so do all the problems and the worries and the stress. And so imagine having a dream like this, and you're going, what does this mean? He knew there was implications about his kingdom with this dream, and it was driving him crazy. 
It was driving him crazy. And then he goes to his men that are in his court. I need some help understanding what this dream is. And so the next section, verses 4 through 11, you see these men that are trying to help out the king, but they're limited. Because the king's like, I don't want you to just make something up as I tell you what the dream was. I I need you to to get serious about this. So serious, in fact, that since you guys are, you know, the magicians and you seem to be able to tap into some kind of power that is outside of you, I need you to tell me what the dream was. Then I'll know that, you know, there's really something supernatural going on here. And then tell me the interpretation. And these men, I mean, access denied. They're like, hey, that's a big ask, my friend. And you're going to kill us if we, if we don't pony up with this? I mean, I'm sure they were talking amongst themselves. Okay, like who's one of the best here? Dude, are you getting anything right now? Like he's going to kill us. Figure it out. And they're stressed out. And they even say no one on earth can tell the king his dream. They said the king's demand, it's impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, how misguided that is. And then they make the statement, and they don't live here among the people. Here's the amazing thing about the God of the universe is he's already at work. He's the one giving Nebuchadnezzar the dream, but he's also the one setting this up. He says, yeah, actually, God does live among his people, and he's got... Daniel to help out the king. Well, because of the stress that's on the king, this next section, you get to see how ticked off the king is. Verse 12, the king was furious when he heard these men say, we can't do this for you. And so he's like, well, if uh, you're no good, then I think we'll just execute you. I'm done with you. That's his decree. And so this is all going on, and you see again the stress that he's under with the kingdom. He needs an answer. And so this execute Daniel and his friends. They're a part of this court, these men that are to be used for the king. And this order of execution comes to them, and Daniel, he's like, we got to do something about this. And so he tells his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he's like, guys, we got to pray. We have to pray. I, we, we can't do this in our own strength. We can't just make this up and hope we're right. I mean, our life is on the line. We really need God to show up. So he urged them, ask the God of heaven to show you this. Remember, the, the magicians were probably going to themselves like, do you have it? Do you have Like, Daniel goes, just go to God about this. This is beyond us. And it's this prayer of desperation. God, we really need you to show up right now. And then the next verse in verse 19, guess what? He does. God shows up. That night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And you think, Daniel and his friends, when God shows up in such a way, to me, what happens next is this natural response when God shows up. I mean, we're so relieved and we're like, God, thank you. Because in verse 19, it says, Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And we see this praise. We see this thanksgiving taking place. The verse for this past week, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He's acknowledging the only way this could have happened, God, is if you were behind this and you gave us the answer. So I just want to acknowledge that, that this wisdom did not come from myself. It came from you. And the power to be able to know what someone dreamed when I wasn't there and he hasn't talked to me and I, I know what the dream is and I know the interpretation. God, this is clearly from you. I want to acknowledge that wisdom and power are yours. And then he goes on to say, you control the course of world events and you remove kings and you set them up. And I want to pause on this for a second because I think some of the interpretation that Daniel got, he's speaking some of that out right now in the praise. 
And we'll get to the interpretation in a second. But part of that is that there's kings that are, are rising and falling in this dream. And Daniel says, God, you're in control of all of that. No matter how big the empire might be, you are in control. And you see ahead of time that kingdoms will rise and kingdoms will fall, but God is on his throne. Let that be something that gives us peace in our world today. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. God is in control. It says he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. He reveals deep and mysterious things. In this case, that was exactly what happened. What was hidden in darkness has been brought to light. And God, we thank you for giving us wisdom and strength and revealing to us what this king had demanded. And so Daniel's like, get me in front of the king because I'm going to tell him what the dream was and the interpretation And while that's all going down and the conversation is sort of developing into that, Daniel takes a moment to give some vertical recognition. It's his moment here to give God the glory for what has happened. In verse 28, he says, There's a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he's shown Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the future. And Daniel even says that it's not because he's wise that he got the interpretation. Look at how in humility Daniel's saying, this isn't about me, king. This is something that God gave me uh, to give to you. And he who reveals secrets has shown you what will happen. And he has given you this dream because he wants you to understand what's going on in your heart. And so then the dream is revealed. The dream is given. And we see this listed out here as a statue uh, made out of all these different uh, elements of gold and silver and bronze and iron and iron and clay mixed. And then you see this rock comes and crashes down on the feet and then everything begins to crumble and and all of that. And and if you will, it's kind of like the head and shoulder, knees and toes moment here of this dream And there's empires, there's kingdoms here that are represented with each of these elements. And the first one represented him, the head of gold. This is you, king. This is Babylon. And then after you, there'll be another kingdom. And so as we know them today, these would be like the next one was Medo-Persia. And then after that, the bronze that would be around the waist and thighs would have been Greece. And then the legs of iron would be Rome, these kingdoms that were coming in the future. And then you get to these toes, right, in this mixture of iron and clay. And many interpret that to be a revived Rome that is going to happen in the future. So what Daniel was seeing was prophetic. Things that were happening right there and then because King Nebuchadnezzar was the gold head and his kingdom was that. And then... In the future, there's going to be these other kingdoms. And they, they rose and they fell. And then we're still waiting for these other ones to play out. That would be the feet. And um, to help illustrate this a little further, I have a little statue that you guys are welcome to kind of pass around and get a visual uh, of just all of these different kingdoms and maybe what this would have been like. We ha- I had this ordered this week, and Brady snapped me a picture. He said, I'd like to thank the Academy for the award today. <laughs> but if you would, just go ahead and pass that around. But here's why I said it's the gospel dreamer. And it's because that rock, who's the rock? Jesus. And that rock was going to come and crush this kingdom that would represent the toes, the feet. And we know that God is up to something, and that rock knocks the statue down. And so there's some things to talk about with this. All these kingdoms, they rise and fall, but did you know that there's an eternal kingdom that will last forever? And it's brought in by the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's coming a day... When Jesus will literally set up his kingdom here on this earth, bringing it down from heaven to earth, and he will rule here on this earth. 
In the meantime, his kingdom is very much alive and active, and it's here, and it's now. And those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and say, I want to be a part of this kingdom, I want to serve in this kingdom, God brings you in, and you're marked by the king, and you will get to partake in what his kingdom looks like in the future. But what's interesting with this is in verse 44, Daniel says, during the reigns of those kings, so he's referring to to all of those kingdoms, he says the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. So I know that there's a future kingdom that's coming when Jesus will set this up on the earth, but God in his sovereignty is in the process of setting up this kingdom all the way back here to this moment with Daniel. God is working through his chosen people. He's working through his chosen line of descendants and he's going to bring about this king Jesus and Jesus very much showed up a little over 2000 years ago and he lived on this earth and he lived a perfect life because he was going to be the perfect sacrifice for the payment of the curse of sin and he went to the cross and he died on the cross for you and for me and for all humanity and that whoever puts their faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of that sin will have eternal life. God is at work even all the way back here at this moment, some 600 B.C. He is setting up his kingdom. His kingdom is here today, and there's a future aspect to this kingdom. And so the last portion here, verses 46 and 47, you see God given the glory here. There's an awkward kind of messed up thing that we don't necessarily get the resolve on when Nebuchadnezzar falls down to worship Daniel. It's not like there was a verse here where Daniel goes, and I was really uncomfortable with that, and I said, hey, don't do that. Get up. Like that, that. We don't see how that was cleared up. But what we do see is when Nebuchadnezzar opened his mouth, he gave glory to God in heaven. And he says, truly, he's the Lord over all kings, the revealer of mysteries. And you've been able to reveal this secret, the dream that I've had. You know, it's really cool in this too is chapter one ended where you saw this divine favor that was given to Daniel and his friends and you see this chapter wrapped up with the same, the divine favor once again. Daniel is now put in a position that right underneath the king, he is the most powerful person in Babylon. And then Daniel asks for a promotion for his friends which is also granted. And so you see God's favor on this. While they're in a land and a culture that is filled with all these ungodly things, God is still at work. And his favor is still upon them. So here's just a few things in closing. You'd say the application for today. The first one, it was here last week, it's showing up again. I said this is a bit of a theme in the book of Daniel. God honors the right decision. And I want to point out to you what the right decision was. There's a whole lot of stress and pressure with the fact that if we don't figure this out, we're as good as dead. And so Daniel makes a right decision. What does he do? Praise, good. He prays. He goes, I can't do this on my own. And so how many times when things are going on in our life, does it seem like prayer is like the last thing that we go to? Thing, go to the Lord in prayer. Man, when we're faced with that kind of pressure, go to the Lord in prayer. And when you do that, that's the right decision. I'm gonna go to the Lord in prayer. I'm gonna ask him for his wisdom. I'm gonna ask him to show up. I'm gonna ask him... To help me, God will honor that. He will help you. Number two, this is a question. This is for all of us listening. 
I want to make sure that this question is settled for everybody. Are you in God's eternal kingdom? Are you in his kingdom? What does it mean to be in his kingdom? I mentioned earlier Jesus came to this earth to pay the penalty and the price for sin. But to be in the kingdom of God, you have to come to a place where you realize, I need Jesus. My sin needs to be dealt with. Well, he's ready to deal with it. You come to Jesus in faith and you repent of your sin and Jesus will forgive you and he brings you into his kingdom. And if you're a part of the kingdom right now, you're a part of the kingdom forever. Are you in God's eternal kingdom? If you can't answer that with a real sure yes, then I encourage you to settle that question today when I close this message. Be a part of the kingdom of God. It's eternal. Kingdoms may rise and fall. This might cause something to stir in some people, but I want to tell you something right now. Our country, America, is not eternal. And how we get so worked up of all the affairs in this kingdom when God's going, hey, what about my kingdom? Are you taking that serious? God's kingdom is eternal. Here's the last question for us of application. Where do you need God to show up? Just like Daniel and his three friends, they needed God to show up. There's a prayer of desperation that they were lifting to the Lord. God, we need you right now. And so all different walks of life, listening to this message right now, is there an area in which you need God to show up? Is there an area where, God, I need wisdom. We need an answer in regards to this. God, we need your provision in in this situation. God, we, we need some healing here in this situation. God, there's a relationship here that's just not working out. We need you to show up in this situation. Whatever it might be, do you need God to show up? And if that's the case, do what Daniel and his friends did. And go to the Lord in prayer. God, I know you can show up just like you did for Daniel and his friends. Would you please show up for me, for us? Whatever it is you're going through, go to the Lord in prayer, asking for him. Lifting up that prayer of desperation and looking to the one who can do something about it. As we prepare to close this message and enter into uh, kind of our response here. One of the things I'm going to do is invite the prayer team to come forward when the worship team comes forward. I invite the elders also, if you're able, to come forward. Pastors, I'll be up front as we're worshiping here in this last song. If you would like someone to partner with you in praying, feel free to come forward to meet with the prayer team. Would you pray with me right now? Father, I thank you for the encouraging of your spirit and the hope we have in Jesus that when we're walking through circumstances, whatever they might be, there might be these prayers of desperation that we, we lift up to you, but we look at an account like this And I believe that the same God who showed up for Daniel and his friends will show up for people right here and right now. And so, God, I'm asking for your grace here today as your spirit ministers to us. Whatever is on our heart right now, Lord, we lift to you. We ask for you to move upon these things. Lord, if there's anyone listening right now as they think about what it means to be in the kingdom of God and to ask that question, are you in God's eternal kingdom? If you can't answer yes to that at this moment, but you want to settle that right here and right now, then I invite you to pray with me to receive Jesus.
Just pray with me in your heart and say, Lord, I surrender my life to you. I am a sinner who needs to be saved. And I put my faith and trust in what you have done for me on the cross. And I ask for forgiveness of my sin. Please cleanse me. Make me a new person. And I pray that you would help me to walk out my faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for this gift of salvation. Thank you for bringing me into your kingdom. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.